what circle of growth are we in at the present time? Uh, I, I take uh, a third of a million, a half a million, a million. Or I take two million years. Uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's upon us is what I'm trying to say. Heavens, no. You see, here's what I don't know. So far, civilization killed itself with dry rot. We we rot out our gene structure. We let the nitwits outbreed uh, leadership. And I have a feeling when the potential for leadership gets too far below about 2% of the population, you've had it. And if you were to ask me to estimate this leadership, I'd say about 1% of half of the leaders are altruistic and semi-religious minded, and the other half are damn selfish. But they both have ability. You know, and then you go back to the jungle, and right away you clean up your gene structure, because the strong kill the weak and the smart kill the stupid, and you start out with a with a better gene structure, and you build civilization again. Now, th th we keep doing this, see, up and down, up and down. This has gotten further complicated by the fact that war is getting to be really lethal in a major way. I have the foggiest notion whether Western civilization or Russian civilization is going to last. The uh, the Arantia books all over the world now. It'll last. Maybe it'll last in Patagonia. And I don't know, but what, 50,000 years from now, the Patagonians and the Eskimos may meet for the first time in the equator in the radioactive lands that are now have become re-inhabitable. And on our time clock, our big time clock here, this is not important. You get it? Because 50,000 years is too short a time to be measured on that clock. This is not even a tenth of a microsecond. <laughs> if we don't wreck ourselves, if this civilization endures, then we must make it in some such time span. <coughs> but we can go up and down a number of times and start over from scratch again. With a few salvage Encyclopedia Britannicas and uh, Kent's Engineering Handbook and a couple of Urantia books surviving maybe from one era to another. I don't know how many times we'll destroy ourselves. As I read history, I subscribe to an inscription written in cuneiform on a clay tablet that was baked in Babylonia. And here's what it says. When you stop to think about it, people are stupid. That was a Babylonian observation about mankind. And when I stop to read history, I say, gee, we don't do so well. We don't learn. There's a Cambridge Don that I would like to have met. He's a historian. His name is Previt Horton. Isn't that a lovely name? Not Privy Orton, Previt Orton. <laughs> uh, and he was one of the editors of the Cambridge Medieval History, which is a formidable thing. And the board of editors asked him to do the shorter Cambridge Medieval History. That's in two volumes that are about that thing. And he had access to the finest writing that was done by the finest scholars on each subject. The guy that discusses Spain and a certain era is probably a Spanish professor of history at the University of Toledo. And at the end of this job, there's a, there's a wonderful paragraph that I, I'll try and paraphrase. As he's surveying medieval European history, he said, I can't help but see how many bright dreams were smashed by the cupidity and the stupidity of mankind. How many worthwhile efforts
Stanford died because men lacked altruism. How many times a turning in history was frustrated because of selfishness and greed? He said, as I look back, I can perceive how crooked and how perilous was the long path upward. It's a very great statement of appreciation of the turmoil and the struggle and, and the such a slow accumulation of wisdom on the part of mankind. That's why it's hard to figure quite. <laughs> Will we last? Will we make it? <coughs> you see, just in case you're feeling a little good about our prospects, permit me to encourage your pessimism. You know, we, we can see everything that's wrong about Russia, can't we? Christianity suffers under a great handicap because it has become identified in the minds of all the world as a part of the social system, the industrial life, and the moral standards of Western civilization. And thus has Christianity unwittingly seemed to sponsor a society which staggers under the guilt of tolerating science without idealism, politics without principles, wealth without work, pleasure without restraint, knowledge without character, power without conscience and industry without morality. That's their indictment of our culture. A society which staggers under the guilt of tolerating it. Page 2086. Paragraph 6. The hope of modern Christianity is that it should cease to sponsor the social systems and industrial policies of Western civilization, while it humbly bows itself before the cross that so valiantly extols, there to learn anew from Jesus of Nazareth the greatest truths mortal man can ever hear, the living gospel of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. You see, we aren't so much, are we? not as they look at it. I have read critiques of Western Christendom written by Japanese Buddhists, by Indian Hindus, and let me tell you, when you listen to an alien an intelligent, educated alien criticize our society, they find many flaws. Many flaws. We're used to them. But this is quite an indictment. Science without idealism. Politics without principles. Wealth without work. Pleasure without restraint. Knowledge without character, power without conscience, industry without morality. That's us they're talking about. We tend to be smug. We tend to be provincial and parochial in our thinking. We, 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 we glorify ourselves. We can see how clearly the Russians rewrite history. We do not see how clearly we rewrite history. When I was a, a, a laddie, my 
dearest buddy was the son of an Anglican minister who became a Unitarian and then took the final step and became president of the Chicago Ethical Society. You know, this is the group that want to have the brotherhood of, of man without the fatherhood of God, otherwise known as the bastard brotherhood. Uh, you want truth without creed. But the Reverend Dr. Bridges was a great guy intellectually, and I enjoyed life at his home. And as a result, a great deal of my reading was the reading of an English schoolboy growing up, because the library came over with the Bridges family. And I read a book written by Arthur Guy Henty, who wrote many adventure books, but this book would never be published in this country. This book was entitled True to the Old Flag, and it was the story of a Tory family in the Revolutionary War, a family who were not rebels, but were loyalists. They were true to the old flag. As Winfield Scott was true to the old flag, though he was a Virginian, as Robert E. Lee was not. Do you get this? <coughs> Later on, this is a terrible shock to me when I realized the difference between Jefferson Davis and George Washington was success and failure at the last battle. They'd have hung Washington if they had won. And our history would have pointed out Washington was a dirty rebel. Later on, <laughs> and I never forgot this, I got into the whole question of taxation at the time of the American Revolution. And I want to tell you something, it's a very visible story you read it impartially. England was dealing with 13 feisty Eman de Valeras over here who were perfectly willing that Englishmen should tax themselves to defend the frontier, but these colonies were completely unwilling to tax themselves unless the money would be reimbursed from the British Treasury and spent locally for local industrial profits. It's quite a shock to read the story of the American Revolution from a non-American perspective. When you realize how selfish the colonies were, how much they wanted England to do, how little they were willing to do to protect themselves. This is quite, a, quite an education to read this. It's a little unsettling to read it. Major shock as a freshman in high school. I said, 
gee whiz, there's two, there's two sides to this story. My books don't agree with the rest of the class. Now, what's the truth? We rewrite our history, too. If you will carefully reread American history, you will discover that up through about 1868, the English are good guys. And suddenly, they all wear black hats. Because up till 1868, we're together, see? We're fighting the French and the Indians. It's hard to read this about ourselves, but that's their opinion of us, and it's not a very high opinion, is it? I think it's there. <coughs> the Midwayer Commission, under the presidency of Mantusha Melchizedek, have endorsed this indictment of Western civilization. That's what they think of. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Why is America helping other nations? Is this because we are great Christians? Or is it because we fear communist competition? Let's go back into the Middle Ages. They, they had their share of blood and turmoil. But what kept people on the line as much as possible in the Middle Ages? Was it the love of God? or the fear of hell. The fear of hell. These guys could sit them, see themselves sitting on a white hot rock looking at a wristwatch that was calibrated in cycles of eternity. And no, 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 no hope for this. It's fear motivated. And we're still altruistic because we're fear motivated. Not because we're positively motivated to help our fellow men. Why, why may there be a United States of Europe? There's one of warning, I think. Mm -hmm. It'll be a great thing. Because men are wise enough to lay nationalism aside and cooperate? No. The fear of Russia. Why are we cleaning up our educational system and taking some of the fat and lard out of it? Is it because we realize that this is necessary for our youth? No. Sputnik did this to us. We aren't ready yet to make progress without the fear of competition. This is not a high civilization we live in, is it? We need a goal. We don't yet respond to the positive lure. We need a whip. <coughs> That's why I said we may get to visit a primitive world like your ranch. Arnold Toynbee, I think, correctly appraises modern men. And his, his designation is both kind and accurate. He speaks of man in process of civilization. In the 12th century A.D. in Europe, which is the beginning of the Middle Ages, they spoke of themselves as modern. We think of ourselves as modern. 500 years from now, I shouldn't be in the least surprised if historians refer to the present age as the later days of barbarism. Considering how many people we killed in World War I, World War II, the genocide practice on the Jews in the last war, these are bar barbarian times, aren't they? I mean, Genghis Khan didn't kill anymore. Or Tamerlan. Clyde, forgive me for my note of pessimism. But but we aren't such a much. <coughs> well, Jesuits started it to stay in the basement of the store bone. Yeah. With a few philosophers. That's right. And please, Mal, don't get me wrong. I love this country. Imperfect as it is, and I've worn arms for it, and I've been shot at wearing its uniform, and I have medals to prove it. <coughs> I mean, lousy as 
this country is. It's the greatest thing, I think, that the world has ever seen. But that doesn't take this indictment away. But it should make us strive to be more than we are. Here's the, here is the answer, I think. It's not legislation. You don't legislate people into the kingdom of heaven. It's working from the inside of the guy. If two men sit down to bargain an industrial problem, and if neither knows God nor realizes brotherhood, this is a test of wits and shrewdness and cunning. If two men sit down to bargain and both know God and both understand brotherhood, they may be just as shrewd, but there's a certain aspect of fairness that will be present in the second situation that is completely absent in the first. This, to me, is the hope of civilization. Arnold Toynbee started writing his study of history with the opinion that religion was an important byproduct of civilization. At the end of 30 years of work on this 10-volume work, he ended writing his history with the conclusion that the main purpose of civilization is the generation of religion. It's not the byproduct, it is the end product of civilization. That's what 30 years of thinking about history did to that English, and I agree with it.
Did you earn it? You inherited it. We have freedom of worship in this country. Did you earn it? No. It's a part of your rich inheritance. We have a country that is so fed up that even if your parents are indifferent to education, society insists that you be educated. You're going to learn how to read and write, and you're going to have a chance to go on. Did you earn this? One of the royal governors of the House of Burgesses in colonial Virginia objected to too many schools. He said this produces unrest among the common people. And he's quite right, it does. It also produces the ferments of progress. <coughs> you didn't earn the right to vote either, did you? You didn't earn any part of the richness of the inheritance which an American citizen takes for granted. Did you ever stop of off and think about all the little people whose names are not in the history book that supported the people whose names are recorded and made it possible for these progressions to take place? Did you ever stop think about those people? It took a lot of small support to make it possible for certain improvements to be made. Did you ever think how much you owe these people that are long dead and gone that earned what we cash in on? Did you ever think how nice it would be to go back and thank them for their efforts to make it as good as it is? Then I'll ask you the $64 question. How could you take so much give nothing in return. To me, this is the morality of civilization. We have reaped where we have not sown. We should be willing to sow where we have no chance to reap. We have a rich inheritance which we did not earn. We should be willing to enrich the inheritance of our successors even though we, we cannot hope to see <coughs> the fruits of those efforts. I thought about the guys that encouraged Ben Franklin, one of the sanest Americans who ever lived, I think. He had, he had a lot of people that bought him and supported him. And it made it possible for him to do some things that represented distinct advances and thinking, society, and whatnot. And I don't think we're big people, but I think we're important little people. And we've got to get a lot of them. You're not going to improve civilization basically by passing laws. You're going to improve civilization basically by putting God in men's hearts. Such men act a little differently from those who do not have that experience. There's an element of love, an element of tolerance, an element of give and take, an element of hope, an element of optimism that's absent in the heart of the materialist, who at worst worships himself and at the lousy best worships the state. I think this is more important than the discovery of atomic energy. Atomic energy may blow us apart. This may pull us together someday. All men. This presents God rationally. I talked to a young man, a very sophisticated young man, extremely sophisticated young man, age 20. Uh, he's going to Princeton. We got touched upon religion lately. And he said to me, well, he said, uh, I got tired of carrying God, so I put him down. Well, I know his background. I know his religion. And I know probably 
only the way God has been presented to him. And I can see how he could put that kind of a God down. And of course, he's not hungry for this book, so we didn't even touch it on it. He doesn't put God down, but he's tired of carrying the very poor conception of God that's been presented to him intellectually. And it's not well done. This is our job. This is our job now. To learn this, to teach it, and to be patient. We're building Eden. And Adam will not come in our day. But he'll come someday. But somebody has to build Eden. page 
555, last paragraph. You will learn that you increase your burdens and decrease the likelihood of success by taking yourself too seriously. Nothing can take precedence over the work of your status sphere, this world or the next. Very important is the work of preparation for the next higher sphere, but nothing equals the importance of the world in which you are actually living. But though the work is important, the self is not. When you feel important, you lose energy to the wear and tear of ego dignity so that there is little energy left to do the work. <laughs> Self-importance, not work importance, exhausts immature creatures. It is the self-element that exhausts, not the effort to achieve. You can do important work if you do not become self-important. You can do several things as easily as one if you leave yourself out. Variety is restful. Monotony is what wears and exhausts. Day after day is alike. Just life or the alternative of death. That's a lot of hard bottled wisdom there, you know. Just before that, they say, yeah, they're, you're, you're fraternizing with some of the seraphim up on the mansion world. Angels take delight in service, and when I'm assigned, often minister as volunteers. The soul of many an ascending mortal has for the first time been kindled by the divine fire of the will to service through personal friendship with the volunteer servers of the seraphic reserve. The angel has nothing to do for you. She just takes time off to be friendly. From them, you will learn to let pressure develop stability and certainty, to be faithful and earnest and withal cheerful, to accept challenges without complaint, and to face difficulties and uncertainties without fear. They will ask, if you fail, will you rise indomitably to try anew? If you succeed, will you maintain a well-balanced poise, a stabilized and spiritualized attitude, throughout every effort in the long struggle to break the fetters of material inertia to attain the freedom of spirit existence. Even as mortals, so have these angels been father to many disappointments. And they will point out that sometimes your most disappointing disappointments have become your greatest blessings. Sometimes the planting of a seed necessitates its death, the death of your fondest hopes, before it can be reborn to bear the fruits of new life and new opportunity. And from them you will learn to suffer less through sorrow and disappointment. First, by making fewer personal plans concerning other personalities. And then, by accepting your lot when you have faithfully performed your duty. That's hard-boiled wisdom. This is no Pollyanna stuff that they're writing. This works. How many times have you really taken a fall because you, you made a lot of plans assuming other people would do certain things and they didn't do them? You, of course, you had no right to make those assumptions. And it's so easy to criticize the other person, isn't it? Instead of your own mistaken judgment. <coughs> <coughs> I like that statement. Even as mortals, so have these angels been father to many disappointments. Now, I think this, there's a lot of things that happen down here that you can't explain. And I think it would be folly to try to explain them. Because you'd have to know all of the factors that went into those causes. And that could mean the assembly of an awful lot of data. Possibly more than we could comprehend. Much more than we could correlate. 
I think it's much simpler to simply accept life. As it comes, do the best you can. Between the lesser and the greater, choose the lesser. Very seldom, I think, do we ever hit black and white. We're always dealing with shades of gray. Pick the lighter gray. Uh, if the gradient of the road varies slightly, pick the one that seems to go upward. You may discover that you, 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 you after the slight rise, you become the damnedest valley you ever saw. But you used the best judgment you could when you picked, made the choice at that point. My mother used to express it. She said, when life hands you a lemon, you can still make lemonade if you have the sugar wherewith to sweeten the mixture. It's a nice way of putting it. Now, we've talked about the American Revolution, <laughs> the 12th century A.D. in Europe, Genghis Khan, George Washington, Jefferson Davis, the Hohenzollerns, and an unnamed royal governor of the Virginia House of Burgesses. Would you like to discuss the twist now? We got about 
This has been going on for a long time. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I don't feel any more reverent than that person who participates in the most gorgeous formal ceremony of Easter. They like that. It's, it's a matter of what furniture do you buy for your home? How do you dress? Do you dress richly or plainly? Uh, men don't have this choice anymore, but we used to. We used to have ruffles, you know, and gorgeous fabrics and waistcoats and whatnot. It's a matter of taste. Yes. I think it's also like the consistency that they made inside of the real love uh, thing. Mm-hmm. The real purpose. Less apt to it easier than at Christmas. Yes, but this is what well, George, I see nothing wrong with that. He was a venerable man. I see nothing wrong with that. George, I feel anything that gets people to think partly about God is good. At least partly good. Now, I suspect that there are people who welcome the Easter season simply because of the new costumes that take in display. This is a wholly unspiritual approach to the Easter season. That's unfortunate. It's like the man that faithfully goes to church because he sells more insurance that way to the church members. His motive is not good. But maybe he ties to the church and maybe indirectly he does good. Now, I would approach the Easter season reverently and uncritically. I have no quarrel with, with vestments and gorgeousness. Uh, they have no appeal to me, but I have no quarrel with them. Because they appeal to other people. And who am I to say how my brother shall worship? My brother wants to worship on his knees. Uh, I don't assume any particular posture when I worship, or pick any particular place. There is a place where I'm always alone. It's not a very holy place, but I'm, I'm always alone there. And because I'm alone, I'm more apt to worship there than any other place on the face of the earth. I didn't name the place, I'll leave it to your imagination. Riding a horse out in the... That would be very nice. Yes, yes. Now, well, that's what you were saying. Yes, yes. Right. I like to ride alone in the right. horse. I don't think where you are or what you're doing is particularly important. It's what you're thinking about. George, uh, years ago, when I was about 22, that'll be in the 1840s, um, 1830s, I'm always flying about my age. With all the wisdom of a 22-year-old young man, at a, at a social gathering of the old Chicago Forum, I got up, and I held forth quite urgently against forms and ceremonies and rituals. And there was a gal who got on her feet and rebutted me. Just the right kind of a gal. She was about 30. Very lovely lady. I admired her. <coughs> they meant a lot to her. She'd grown up in the Catholic faith and had left it. But she hadn't left behind her love for this pageantry. And she asked me very poignantly, she said, would you take this away from me? And George, I felt so ashamed. I learned a great lesson that day. I said, no. I said, I'm, I apologize. I'm wrong. This is not for me. But this is for you. There's not a thing wrong with it if you want it. Please don't force it on me. And she smiled and she says, no, of course not. I think the social communities of religion should be unlike so that they can accommodate the differences in human taste. I'll never forget, I uh, had a little fun with BM years ago. He took me to your, is it your Methodist temple? It covers a city block. Mm -hmm. It's tremendous. And little Chris was in the, the youngest choir you know, and they had them by platoons. They came in, you know, and they sang it very lovely and very 
pageant like and, and, and very gorgeous and very ceremonial. And I liked it as a little Balaban and cat to, to my taste because I'm a Quaker. And we got out and CM said, wasn't it lovely? And I couldn't resist pulling his leg. I said, well, it was a little popish. Oh, what do you mean? He said. <laughs> well, I said it was pretty gorgeous to him. I said a little bit on the Catholic order. And um, well, then I made my peace with him. I said, after all, I said my upbringing is on on the Quaker side, with just nothing. This to me is ritual, as far as I care to go. Sitting around and talking like this. I used to give the Chicago Forum. We had a gong, and you could play bugle calls on that gong, you know. And uh, we always banged it to terminate the recess between the first and second half of our session, roughly an hour each. And I used to tell them, I said, this is our ritual. And please remember, none of this spiritual devotion will register with the high gods unless we play this gong just right. And I used to love to play dirty Google calls on it because they didn't know the words. <laughs> Christmas, George, is another one. I'll tell you I'll tell you the reaction I had when I first learned that Christmas was not Christmas. In fact I wrote a little dissertation, I read it to the family that next Christmas. When I learned that August twenty first was Christmas. I analyzed the origin of Christmas because I suddenly felt a void. I mean, something had been taken away from me, you know. And I went back and I, 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 I did my homework and I put together as nearly as I could what is Christmas. Christmas, December 25th, was a high and holy day in the Roman Empire before Christ was born. It was a holy day in Mithraism, which is an offshoot of Zoroastrianism, a very masculine religion for men only, uh, very popular with the Roman legion. Christmas also incorporates something of the Roman general blowout at the end of the year, the so-called Saturnalia. When everybody had a reversal of roles, the, the bosses waited on the employees and the masters waited on the slaves. It was a, a time of lavishness that persisted. Christmas incorporates the Teutonic legend of the hero who needs help in his mission. Perhaps the slaying of a dragon, the liberation of a princess, the going on a crusade, and something impels him to go out in the forest. And there, under this lofty fir tree, lies the magical gift, the sword which he needs to accomplish his mission. These two traditions come together in our Christmas. And I summed up this little essay by saying, Christmas is no longer Jesus' birthday, but Christmas now symbolizes to me the upreach of evolutionary religion, seeking for the downreach of revelatory religion. And ever since that day, that's what Christmas has symbolized to me. It's the upreach of the religion which man has made <coughs> and is looking for help to improve. I'd like to share that feeling with you. Christmas is still a holy day to me, but it's not Jesus' birthday. It stands for all of man's striving, his superstition, but also his hunger for God. Christmas is man asking questions. August 21st is the answer to the question. 
But I had to do something about Christmas. It just couldn't be an orphan. A vacuum. Or a vacuum, yeah. That's what Christmas means to me. And yet, uh, we're going to have one because it always develops. It always develops. The personality is just in the nature of human beings. Now look, consider um, <coughs> we have we have developed a certain element of custom here in Oklahoma that is applied at lunch. I hope we have the executive suite because this is where we are accustomed to meeting. And there is step one in the development of ritual. This is this is the customary place where we meet. We feel a little more at home in this room. There is there is the beginning, you think. Right, right. It starts out as custom, then becomes sanctioned and hallowed by tradition. Until finally, uh, if you want to look at the pernicious side of it, a person might develop a superstitious regard for this rule and feel that it would be somehow wrong not to meet in the truth. Then you've got the, the bad side of the cult. In the meantime, it's a convenient place to meet because we're used to meeting here and we all come here. That's the benign side of the cult. <coughs> In the past, truth has grown rapidly and expanded freely. When the cult has been elastic, the symbolism expands now. Abundant truth and an adjustable cult have favored rapidity of social progression. A meaningless cult vitiates religion when it attempts to supplant philosophy and to enslave reason. A genuine cult grows. We're talking about form and actuality. We're talking about the river banks and the river. You can't have a river without banks. But the river banks are not the river. If we can be intelligent in our attitude toward our customs, our traditions, then I think we will accomplish something. I think there's great value in tradition. There's value in custom. So long as we don't worship it. We can develop traditions if we do not confuse first and second values, means and ends. If we remember that God is the only final end, then we can have a cult without being cultish. Then we can be a group without being a sect. Then we can be a brotherhood without being a church. We don't need another church. We don't need another sect. We have a plethora of them. Now, how do we do this? Every time you meet a spiritually hungry brother, if you feel impelled Telling about the Urantia books, you're sectarian, you're cultish. He may not be in the market for the Urantia books. He may just be in the market for God. Let's say he's a dissident Roman Catholic. And the best way to help him is to send him back to his, to his, to his, to his church. Tell him to go make a confessional. That's, a, that's the most direct route for this man to take to find God. And I say this is the most desirable route. For him to follow and find God. You can find that you can find God in any group. If we feel that we must use this book, then we are a sect. 
if we use this book as a tool, as a means, and recognize that God is the end, then we're not sectarian. If I if I meet a man who's hungry for God, I'm interested in reintroducing him to God. If in the process I find he is disillusioned with what convention offers him, then I've got a prospect for the book. But the book always comes second. God comes first. And I don't, uh, many times I have religious discussions with people. I never mention the rich, but my best judgment, they're not in the market. They're in the market for God. <coughs> you see, that's what made, that's where they got fouled up with Jesus. Jesus never said, you got to believe in me. He said, you must believe in my father. And it was his followers that made Jesus a condition of membership, a condition which Jesus never imposed. You know he wouldn't do that because if he's not equal, he wouldn't, he wouldn't equal country. Regardless of the drawbacks and handicaps, every new religion of truth has given rise to a new cult. And even the restatement of the religion of Jesus must develop a new and appropriate symbolism. Modern man must find some adequate symbolism for his new and expanding ideas, ideals, and loyalties. This enhanced symbol must arise out of religious living, spiritual experience, and this higher symbolism of a higher civilization must be predicated on the concept of the fatherhood of God and be pregnant with a mighty ideal of the brotherhood of man. What progress have we made in this direction? And please remember, earlier they said you don't invent these things. They accumulate like hash in a restaurant. The, the effective ones are unconscious evolutions. We have deliberately adopted a symbol, three concentric circles. It's a good symbol. In the Lucifer Rebellion, it was the Trinity emblem which was displayed as the by Gabriel when he rallied the loyal. It was the emblem which Machiavelli and Melchizedek wore in the place when he walked into Art Mountain, hut one day. That I'm Melchizedek, priest of El Eliyahu, the Most High God. Um, as good as them to them. And it has the, it has the appeal of being fresh and unique. And it's an appropriate symbol. I can't think of a better symbol for the Trinity. Can, can any of you folks? It, 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 it's a unity, and yet there, are, there's a freeness there. The It's about the only symbolism we have so far. Can you think of anything else that's growing? Well, we start with three concentric circles. We have a symbol. The old cults were too egocentric. The new must be the outgrowth of applied love. The new cult must, like the old, foster sentiment, satisfy emotion, and promote loyalty. But it must do more. It must facilitate spiritual progress, enhance cosmic meaning, augment moral value, encourage social development, and stimulate a high type of personal religious living. That's a big full of good. The new cult must provide supreme goals of living which are both temporal and eternal, social and spiritual. I don't know how to do this. I'm, I'm handicapped by two limitations. One, I share with you the limitation that we don't divide these things. They have to grow. And secondly, 
I have the I have the further limitation of never having been a member of any religious group except the Rich Brotherhood. So I have no parallel experience to draw. I've only observed other groups. I'll tell you the best I found in a study of comparative religion. The most appealing thing I ever read in the story of the Buddhist temple. Picture a community in uh, Thailand. There's a, uh, this is a little more than a village. It's a, it's a fairly important trading center. It supports the temple. There's a yellow garb monk always in attendance. And this gal is going shopping. She's going to the equivalent of a Thai shopping center. And on the way, she parks Junior at the temple. She goes in and makes her obeisance, and she leaves him there. And other kids are there. And this monk is uh, a part-time playground. <coughs> and when she's made her purchases, she picks Junior up and they go home. And the child's first association with religion is playing in the shadow of the temple with other children. I think that is simply terrific. It's pleasurable. It's not a heart beat. It's not listening to a lot of adult gobbledygook that's way over his head. It's not having to be clean and starched and unnatural. You set the sand a little kid. The temple is a place of pleasure. And what a wonderful start to associate religion <laughs> with pleasure. And the youth centers are building now. I mean, they say, yeah, yeah. To associate with life. Yeah. It's not a bunch of restrictions. Right. Places. Right. I think it's a very sweet picture. And it, it explains some of the survival <laughs> values of Buddhism. No cult can endure and contribute to the progress of social civilization and individual spiritual attainment unless it is based on the biologic, sociologic, and religious significance of the home. There, to me, is the greatest natural church in the world. I can think of no greater author than the family heart. And the perfect priesthood is the father and mother teaching religion to their children. This is a natural thing. A surviving cult must symbolize that which is permanent in the presence of unceasing change. It must glorify that which unifies the stream of ever-changing social metamorphosis. It must recognize true meanings, exalt beautiful relations, and glorify the good values of real nobility. In other words, it's not concerned with politics, is it? Our government, our teachers' salaries, or reform movements. It's not directly concerned with these things, is it? Do you remember what it was that wrecked the Melchizedek missionaries in Mesopotamia? They decided to clean up temple prostitution. Melchizedek had commissioned them to teach his gospel. And the Gospel of Melchizedek stated simply as God is trustworthy. He keeps his covenant. He had never commissioned these people to engage in social reform. They attempted to clean up temple prostitution, which we will all agree is a desirable thing. But society wasn't ready for that. Thing. This is too advanced. They failed, and in their failure, were socially discredited. And then lost their spiritual opportunity. They gambled their spiritual treasure on a social project 
which was a very bad gamble. <coughs> but the great difficulty of finding a new and satisfying symbolism is because modern men as a group adhere to the scientific attitude, eschew superstition, and abhor ignorance. While as individuals, they all crave mystery and venerate the unknown. No cult can survive unless it embodies some masterful mystery and conceals some worthful unattainable. I thought about that. I think we got our mystery. Where'd the book come from? And the worthful unattainable is to imitate the life of Jesus. That's enough to keep us working for the next 100,000 years. Now, where did this book come from? That's a mystery. It will be to an increasing mystery down through the generation. But you can't, you can't uh, predicate a cult on a mystery which does violence to man's modern skepticism. You see, we've done a complete switch. In the days of Jesus, they were looking for miracles. Anything unusual had to be miraculous. Today, if uh, something happened over in that corner that uh, was a little difficult to explain, I'm sure we would all go over and investigate the corner. We wouldn't assume that something supernatural was taking place. Am I correct? My whole instinct would be to say, well, how did they do that thing? <laughs> I would just say, well, we've had a manifestation. We are ingrained skeptics. In the first century AD, they were ingrained believers. When Jesus woke up the widow's son at, where was it? Oh, Nain, wasn't it? They were on the, on the verge of burying this boy who was in a state of trance. He wasn't dead. He woke him up to prevent a tragedy. And then they said, well, he's, he's raised him from the dead. And he said, nobody wasn't dead. And the apostle said, you see how modest he is. He won't even admit a miracle when he works for They wouldn't even believe Jesus when he denied that it was a miracle. They were miracle-minded. Today we are anti-miracle-minded. If I see something I can't explain, I want to see where the mirror, where the piano wires, what was the mechanical device. One of my dearest friends as a kid was Howard Thurston, a magician. He used to take quarters out of my nose and he gave me the quarters. That was the nicest part. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, we'd always look for the gimmick, wouldn't we? Where's the catch in this? And yet we crave the unknown. I think the mystery that will, around which the Urantia cult will evolve, I don't like the word any better than you do, but there it is, is where did this book come from? Because you can explain all you want to, but you still haven't quite explained the whole bit. The great difficulty of finding a new and satisfying symbolism is because modern men, as a group, adhere to the scientific attitude, eschew superstition, and abhor ignorance, while as individuals they all create mystery and venerate the unknown. No cult can survive unless it embodies some masterful mystery and conceals some worthful unattainable. Again, the new symbolism must not only be significant for the group, but also meaningful to the individual. The forms of any serviceable symbolism must be those which the individual can carry out on his own initiative and which he can also enjoy with his fellow. If the new cult could only be dynamic instead of static, it might really contribute something worthwhile to the progress of mankind, both temporal 
the spiritual. I thought of a symbolism which might be worth exploring. The, the resurrection of the Last Supper is not a ritualistic partaking of a sip of grape juice and a morsel of bread, the typical sacrament of both the Catholics and the Protestants. Now, see, the Catholics don't get a crack at being wine. They just get the bread. Um, when they, when the 13 of them sat down to dinner <laughs> in the upper chamber of the home of, a, of the march, they didn't have a sacrament, they had a meal. And it was a conventional meal of uh, that time and place. And what, what, what do you suppose it would be like if you ran him periodically, not in too large a group, at least no more than facilities could feed? We sat down and had a meal in commemoration of Jesus. We ate dinner together. The only difference between that dinner and any other dinner is the topic of conversation would be the carpenter. We might actually go through the business at the start of the meal of breaking bread and passing it around and remembering the words that he spoke as he broke bread. And of pouring whatever drink is appropriate to that meal. It doesn't have to be wine. And it doesn't have to not be wine either. Whatever drink is appropriate. I'd say coffee would be just as appropriate as wine. Wine is what they conventionally had. Uh, today it would be coffee, milk or buttermilk or iced tea. The, the, uh, the stuff that we eat is not important. But it was food and drink. That's the important thing. That to me is the principle of the symbolism. Then we sat down. We had we had a meal together. We talked about it. This would be the supper of remembrance. And not some ultra formalized thing that you go through ritual ritual wise in a place where you don't normally eat, like a church. This should be done in a dining room. The original supper was in the dining room. This is where they normally eat. This to me would be a symbolism worth exploring. <coughs> I think the bread should stack up as bread. It doesn't have to be unleavened bread. Just the, the bread which we normally eat. And I would say the drink should be whatever we normally drink at a meal. I mean, this business of going and having to pub a grape juice, uh, it burns me. You know, the Methodist variety of the thing. If you're going to have wine, have wine. But why bother to have wine? The only reason they had wine is because that's what normally was on the table in those days. They didn't do anything out of the ordinary. Except Jesus said a few things when he broke the bread and he said a few things when he passed the beverage. And the rest of the meal was a normal meal. If the new cult could only be dynamic instead of static, it might really contribute something worthwhile to the progress of mankind both temporal and spiritual. But a cult, a symbolism of rituals, slogans, or goals, will not function if it is too complex. And there must be a demand for devotion, the response of loyalty. Every effective religion unerringly develops a worthy symbolism, and its devotees would do well to prevent the crystallization of such a ritual into cramping, deforming, and stifling stereotype ceremonials, 
which can only handicap and retard all social, moral, and spiritual progress. No cult can survive if it retards moral growth and fails to foster spiritual progress. The cult is the skeletal structure around which grows the living and dynamic body of personal spiritual experience, true religion. I find in the <coughs> rancher group at the extremes, those who crave ritual, and at the other extreme, those who are repelled by even any scintilla of ritual. When our society was chartered in Chicago, there's a ritual that has been designed, and I spoke it very loud because there were three members of that society that refused to participate in it. They, they didn't want any ritual. So I, I made enough noise to cover up to the end. Because I don't give a hoot. I'm, I'm in between. <coughs> if, you, if, if the group says we got to all be baptized by total immersion, I'll go down and get baptized tomorrow. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any difference to me. Because it doesn't mean anything to me. And I wouldn't let a little water keep me from fellowship. It's not, it's not worth an argument. And if we got to quit eating pork, I'll quit eating pork. I'll argue like the devil. But if that's the way it's going to be, I'll, 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 I'll quit. I'll quit. See, these things are, are, are not important, you know. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to how do we meld a group of people, some of whom think we have too little ritual, and some of whom are very worried right now about the pernicious infiltration of ritual into the irrational. I, I'm in a fairly neutral corner. Personally, I don't like ritual. But looking at it objectively, I don't object to it, and I know that lots of people like it. So I go along with it, any reasonable amount of it. You see, we can't devise a cult. It'll accumulate. It'll be a, a, a gradual accretion of tradition. I don't know how to do, how to do one. Sir? The only way to keep the cult from going is to keep the people out. And that's what you're trying to bring in. I know. I know. We're too young. I don't think we'll have a real cult uh, of accumulated tradition for a hundred years. We're looking ahead a century, at least, and we, we, we perceive very dimly. Fine. Is there, <coughs> a cult? <coughs> no. In first society, they recite certain things. And uh, I think if we tried to do that in second society, I'd have a palace revolution on my hands. I think I'd be impeached with president of society. That means, you know. Benediction. Yeah. Did they do that every meeting? Yes, that's what I've heard. I wouldn't either, but I'd certainly never institute it. I'd go along with it if the group wanted it, but I'd sure put it to a vote. And it would have to be, if it was 51%, we'd do it, and if it was 49%, we sure wouldn't. <coughs> Question? Yeah? I'd give it some money. Well, I would just want to. Everyone had to carry a pail of water to the pool the day that first 
Well, that's what it was. I was a lad, or rather loosely. Fine, I think that's fine. You'll discover that'll expand, though. Well, I'm there will be those. That. <laughs> Get out of there. there will be those who have a guilt complex and will carry two tails. Uh, J.B. wanted to carry Those are the ones that I... One minute, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> J.B., you know, wanted to carry two things. That's right. But I lost the phone. I can't carry the one. I don't know. J.B. and I appreciate Larry. Yeah. I don't know uh, how we're going to get ritual. In, in, as I analyze my own temperament, I, I belong to the Quaker, Spartan extreme. That's my natural disposition. Uh, I, I try to take the middle of the ground uh, position. I have absolutely no feeling for ritual. But I know that it's very important to many people. And, uh, well, here, I told you this story. Uh, BM took me to the Methodist temple here. And uh, they had all this, uh, these platoons, you know, that came down and sang, and everybody was in robes, and it was all very rich, and lots of pageantry. <coughs> and uh, his little boy Chris was in the smallest of all the group, you know, and it was, it was very interesting. It was sort of like Balaban and Cat, uh, Oriental Theater, you call it. <coughs> and after, afterwards, we came out, and uh, he said, well, what do you think of it? Well, I couldn't resist pulling his leg. I said it was lovely, but I said it's awfully popish. And it just shocked him. Well, I said, it's getting to be awful high church be in for Methodists. Where is it? Here, right here. Here, sir? Yeah. And, and uh, I said, you know, I said, you know, BM, all things are relative. Now, I said, I, I'm accustomed to no ritual. And I said, this was very Roman Catholic to me. No, I had my tongue in the cheek, but, but I couldn't resist pulling his leg just a little bit. Oh, well, and, and relatively speaking, this was a, a rich, ornate ritual. To me, yes. Because to me, this is as far as I've gone in ritual with sitting around the table like this talking. <coughs> but I don't think that I am typical. And I don't think the way I would run, want to run things is a good way to run a society. I think I'm too far out in one, at one extreme. So if a group wanted some ritual, I would I would urge that we have some. I'd try to hold it down. But then there are those over here who want stained glass, who want everything to be done conventional, and, and lots of rich ornateness. And you can go all the way past the Romans to the Greeks. And there's nothing more, more ornate or gorgeous than a real first-class high mass in a, in a Greek Orthodox church. If you've never seen one, you ought to go see one. It's beautiful. People like to know their lines, to know what's going to happen. This is the appeal of masonry, for example. You know exactly what's going to happen. I'm not a mason, but I'm told that th these things are very formal and that it happens the same way every time. And it's a satisfaction in doing it the same way every time. And there are many people who take pleasure and receive satisfaction in doing it the same way every time. We just don't know. What's that? We just don't know. Right. These are, these are differences in human temperament and have nothing to do with spiritual characteristics. 